Hey you guys, at long last, as you may have seen by the title, I am finally creating a leopard gecko care tutorial. Now, before I get started, there's a few things I want to say. This is how I take care of leopard geckos. This is my way of taking care of leopard geckos. It does not mean it is the only way. However, I'm going to be addressing some things in this video that other people do for their leopard geckos that I personally don't do, and I will explain why I don't do those things. Now, I have been keeping leopard geckos since 2015. I have 21 leopard geckos. This is not how I always cared for my leopard geckos. When I first started, I didn't know the importance of two separate types of calcium. I didn't know you had to keep calcium without D3 in the enclosure. I didn't know a lot of things, and so you learn over time, and I am really thrilled to share this knowledge that I've gained over three years with you guys. And a lot of these items and a lot of the things I do to care for my animals come vet recommended and they come breeder recommended from some of my breeder friends. So as you might have noticed, Edard is out. I stole his humid hide. In case anyone's wondering why he doesn't have it, it's just because I'm going to use it for like show and tell today when I talk about how to care for your leopard geckos. So without further ado, here we go. And I have my laptop in front of me. It has all the things I want to talk about. So if I look down at all, that's why. And I just wanted to make sure that I'm very clear and concise in everything that I do and say in regards to creating an educational video that is... I can't even see who that is. Oh, they cover their food bowl with a bunch of fleece, so I can't see who's drinking out of the water bottle, but... It's Remy or Finn, it's one of the rats, I don't know. Alright, let's get to it. So if you're new here, you may have noticed that I have these custom enclosures. Now, I do have a video all about this on my channel. But I have had these custom enclosures since 2015, like the very last month of 2015 going into 2016. We built this bookshelf right here. It's the OG bookshelf, the original. And ever since then we have added one, two, three, four, five. So it's a lot of geckos. There's a lot of custom enclosures. I prefer these two aquariums, but I do have two aquariums up there for Asha and for Marjorie, who are two of my animals that have stunted growth and therefore they don't require as much spacing as these enclosures offer. Because they have stunted growth, they can, you know, fit into 10 gallons. I don't recommend 10 gallons for a leopard gecko that is not stunted in its growth. So if you have a baby or a juvenile leopard gecko, that's fine, but I think it's much better to offer more space and so I don't agree with the minimum sizing for a 10 gallon at all. A lot of sources online and a lot of people will say that 10 gallon is the minimum spacing for a leopard gecko. I think that is incredibly small. I think that whatever, no matter what species it is, whatever the minimum is, you should always make it bigger. So I think that the most appropriate sizing for a leopard gecko's house would be a 20 gallon preferably a 20 gallon long since leopard geckos are not arboreal they don't need the extra height they need the extra length that a 20 gallon would provide and a 20 gallon long for those who like aren't in the u.s or might not know what that is is 30 inches long by 12 inches deep by 12 inches high and that length is really important it offers a lot of room for the leopard gecko to walk around my current enclosures just for reference sake are 24 inches long by 12 inches deep by like hmm, some of them are 13 some of them are 12 inches high and this is the smallest I would keep a leopard gecko in and that's why I recommend a little bit larger some leopard geckos are really big like Varus who's 85 grams or Tywin who's 117 so they need larger enclosures but some geckos are small like Marcella and a 20 gallon tall is plenty space and so you wouldn't need to have the the full you know 30 inches but like I said it'd be a waste to buy a 20 gallon tall because they wouldn't use that extra six inches of height they would use six inches of length better so that's why I recommend it along with the size of the enclosure I'm going to talk about general housing and even decor and so when you have an enclosure that has an animal in it you want to have a secure fitting lid not only will that keep the animal inside it will keep any other animals you may have in the house from getting into the enclosure so always recommend uh, a door or some sort of like you know surface lid and i really recommend front opening enclosures to top opening enclosures because with a front opening enclosure this has a little thing on it that's why it's not opening all the way but you can you know get into the enclosure and that helps the animal see you coming instead of if you're just reaching your hand in from above it's really alarming and it can scare a gecko and also, when you feed something from above, it's not going to be able to distinguish your hand from food. So every time you put your hand in there, it's gonna think that you are food. 
and uh, that doesn't make for very easy handling. So I always recommend front opening enclosures. Exoterra and Zoomed are some front opening enclosures. I don't know if Zoomed makes like a really wide enclosure. Typically I only see them make tall ones, but maybe, I don't know. And it doesn't have to be Zoomed or Exoterra. It could be something that you make on your own or find on your own from another company or even a gecko bookshelf, which are front opening. Whenever someone messages me on Instagram or asks me on YouTube, how do I get my gecko more used to me? I always recommend front opening enclosures because it helps the gecko feel more secure. They can see out, you know, they can see you coming for them. They can see whether or not you're offering food or if you're just coming in to pick them up and the top opening enclosures don't do that. So aside from needing a large enclosure with a secure lid that opens in the front, you're going to wanna to make sure that you have a number of items inside of the enclosure to offer the best life possible for your leopard gecko. And that would include one bowl, two bowl, and I don't have a third one, but you would need possibly a third. So I typically don't have a third bowl because I don't need to put insects in a bowl for my geckos. A lot of mine have special needs and so I hand feed them. You're gonna need a bowl for calcium and we'll talk about that later, but a bowl for calcium, and you're gonna need a deeper bowl for water. I recommend a deep bowl because if you have a shallow bowl, the water will dry out faster, and that just doesn't help anybody because you gotta fill it more, and then they can't drink out of it when you haven't filled it. It's a, it's a mess, so get a deeper bowl. I prefer these like ceramic bowls. This is like a reptile bowl or a hamster bowl. This one is for sure a hamster bowl. I recommend ceramic bowls because they're easy to clean. If you can't find one in the reptile section, go to the hamster section. I got this at the hamster section of Petco. I use these white short bowls for like everything. I mean, you can see one, two, three, four of them in this image right now. So you know I use a lot of them. And they're only like a dollar or two, so they're really cheap. And they're ceramic and they're easy to clean and they last long. And I just much prefer this simple look. A lot of people like the really expensive like nice looking reptile bowls but they're so much harder to clean they take up so much space and this is just way easier so that's just my opinion whatever you want to do is fine just make sure you're keeping it clean now this bowl which is for the calcium you're going to want to make sure that it's not super tall because then you'll just have to dump a bunch of calcium in there and it'd be a waste because you'll find that mostly your gecko is just going to fly the calcium around the enclosure anyway so if you have a short bowl a lot of people just offer like tiny capfuls of calcium but I like to have an actual bowl because I feel like it's more sturdy my geckos are insane they'll just flop it over and make a mess everywhere so if you have an actual short little bowl put calcium in it that's the best way I find to do it and this is another like short bowl I think I actually got this one from Petco in the reptile section but if you have something similar to this in the mammal section it doesn't matter so you might need a third bowl if you choose to feed your leopard gecko from a bowl like if you toss insects in a bowl this is also a really good choice, not for juveniles perhaps because it's so tall, but for a full grown leopard gecko, this one's fine for juveniles. You could put mealworms in it, mealworms can't get out. That's what I have for Mira, as you can see she's got that bowl right there. This bowl is really great for like really big superworms, like I have found the superworms can't get out of this and so that's really good. Aside from the bowls, you're also going to need some sort of hide on the warm side and I think that this is like the most standard one you could possibly have. In fact, it came out of my closet, I'm not even using it because I prefer cork bark if you didn't know you might be new to this channel because this is a video that a lot of people you know might flock to because it's educational but you can see cork bark in that one you can see cork bark in this one these ones are like poor examples because they have a lot of non cork bark but I have cork bark in literally every enclosure I love cork bark it's just amazing you can make levels with it you can sit it up and get really creative with it and like underneath here is a hide like that's how I prefer to use cork bark and I don't actually have like individual hides in most of my houses a lot of my geckos with like eye issues or some sort of special needs that's like really special needs like my really bad enigma syndrome geckos they get caves like this one but I prefer not to use these just because I think that they're aesthetically not appealing to my eyes so I like using cork bark plus these are not as easy to climb on as cork bark so I use cork bark to help them climb easier. But I find that cork bark is just really nice. It offers like a natural look to the enclosure. It offers a place for them to climb and you can, you know, use it to make hot hides or cool hides, but you need to have one hide that's on the warm side. I would use this one for the warm side. And you need to have some sort of hide that's on the cool side. Now, most of my enclosures have more than one piece of cork bark. And so on the cool side, they can just hide underneath of cork bark. But a lot of my enclosures, just have a humid hide on the cool side. Now what's a humid hide? This is a humid hide and I have a whole section about how to make these later on in the video. We'll get back to it, but oh, it just dripped. It just dripped on me. This is Eddard's. I borrowed it from him, like I said, but that's another thing you're gonna need to have in your enclosure. So let's round it all up, say exactly what you need again. You're going to need to hide for the hot side. 
a hide for the cool side, a water dish, a dish for calcium, possibly a dish for insects, and you're also going to need an enclosure that opens from the front, my preference, you don't have to, with a secure closing lid. Now one more thing I want to address about the enclosure itself is cleaning and substrate. Now substrate is a particular topic. A lot of people use loose substrate such as Eco Earth. I personally think that's terrible. I will not use Eco Earth in my enclosures. I will not use sand in my enclosures. Loose substrate is very dangerous for leopard geckos. I have a whole video about it you can go watch. It explains why it's bad for multiple reasons, health reasons, and it's just not good. And also for cleaning purposes, sand is just why? Why even bother? So no calcium sand, no regular sand, no eco earth, no rocks, no pebbles, just no, no, okay? This is what I prefer. I prefer tile first and foremost, but I don't have like tile in all of these because that would be a bit excessive. So I have kitchen cabinet liner, which is this stuff right here. This is a small piece of it and another small piece of it that are folded up in my closet. But this is kitchen cabinet liner. It literally is what it sounds. It's the stuff that you put in cabinets for putting your, you know, dishes on top of when you put them away after coming out of the dishwasher. It literally is kitchen cabinet liner. And I started using kitchen cabinet liner. One, paper towels are very wasteful. Two, a couple of my Enigmas ate paper towel. So I had to move to something that they couldn't eat as easily. And three, this is much, much easier to clean. And as you can see, those enclosures are most recently cleaned. And all I had to do was take a wash rag and scrub any of like the leftover like urate or bug guts that are on this off and it's very easy and that's it you just cut it once to fit the size of your enclosure and then you just clean it you just spot clean it with a wash rag and bada bing bada boom done clean easy instead of having to go through a bunch of paper towels one thing about kitchen cabinet liner one thing you have to get kitchen cabinet liner that has not been treated with chemicals for some reason there are some that are treated with like clorox like brand cleaner and i'm just like why don't do that you don't want to have any chemicals in your geckos enclosure that you don't need so use one that's not and also it doesn't have to be white either they have a bunch of different ones they have granite looking ones there's all kinds of cool stuff it doesn't have to be white i prefer white just for the simplicity of it i guess i don't know i just picked white it was the cheapest but you can also use paper towels yes i have a roll of paper towels up here for show and tell you can use paper towels uh, if you do, I mean, it's just, it's the exact same thing. It's just a little bit more wasteful. It takes a little bit more time to clean because you have to replace it every single time instead of just spot cleaning. But yeah, paper towels are also an option. And so, uh, like I said, my three favorites would be tile, kitchen cabinet liner, and paper towel in that order. However, there is one final substrate that a lot of people use that I can't say no to, but I can't say yes to, and that's reptile carpet. A lot of people use reptile carpet with no problems at all, and that's good for them. Because of the tiny fibers in reptile carpet, a lot of people and their geckos experience issues. For example, like the gecko's teeth or nails will get caught on the individual fibers, and that's dangerous and harmful, so you don't want that. That's why I can't recommend reptile carpet, but a lot of people use it without you know issues so it is what it is but yeah I don't personally recommend it so now we're gonna move on to heating and how you heat your leopard gecko enclosure in my opinion should be from underneath a lot of people try to heat from above but leopard geckos are crepuscular which means that they are most active at dawn and dusk so they don't receive a lot of warmth from the surface like from above where the Sun will be coming from they receive a lot of their heat from underneath from like the ground which is absorbed the heat from the Sun throughout the day because they're crepuscular they don't need a UVB bulb now this is like a controversial thing a lot of people think that geckos would benefit from it and it is perfectly fine to use a non heated UVB bulb on your leopard geckos in addition to a under tank heater however if you supplement with calcium in the way I do, you do not need a UVB bulb and in fact they're, in my opinion, not even essential because they're not a diurnal species. They are crepuscular, like I said, so they wouldn't really be out when the sun's out and therefore wouldn't be receiving UVB from the sun like a bearded dragon would, for example. While I think that under tank heaters are the best and I do not agree with like lighting from above people still do that and they still have success with their leopard geckos but I have seen a lot more like negative health effects than positive health effects from having a light from above I feel like I've seen a lot of burns I've seen a lot of geckos with really dried out skin because it like just takes all the moisture out of the environment when you heat from above and I see a lot of geckos who 
don't come out often because the light bothers their eyes, especially so for albinos. So I think that it's best not to use an above light whatsoever, even though that's what you see in pet stores. Yeah, don't take advice from pet stores. Let's just put that out there now. But anyways, under tank heaters are the best in my opinion. And please, oh God, please don't use heat rocks. They are known for burning leopard geckos and other reptiles. It is not the right way to go. Don't use heat rocks, just don't use heat rocks. Under tank heaters are heaters that are like little pads and some of them just lay flat under the enclosure and others have like adhesive that you can, you know, stick to the underside of the enclosure. Never put them on the inside of the enclosure, always put them on the outside underneath. And when you use an under tank heater, you should use a thermostat. A thermostat is a device that allows you to control the temperature of your under tank heater. And if you don't do that, you are at risk for burns. Well, not you, but your gecko's at risk for burns. And so you should always use a thermostat. Basically, a thermostat has a device that you can change the temperature on and you can read the current temperature. And then it has a long cord and a little probe on the end. The probe you're going to stick on top of where the heated surface is. So basically you'll take the probe, put it where the heater is on the inside of the enclosure. And then that will tell you how hot it is coming through. You'd be surprised how hot under tank heaters get without thermostats, especially on glass enclosures. So once you have the probe there, then you have to figure out what temperature the heat mat is coming through at before you can set the thermostat. This is what an infrared thermometer is for. An infrared thermometer is a literal temperature gun. You just point at something, it beeps and tells you 74 degrees. That's what the pet room is typically. So it'll tell you that's the temperature and what you want to set your thermostat to is 90 degrees. So you have the probe sitting on top of your under tank heater. You set your thermostat to 90 degrees, which is the proper temperature for a leopard gecko. And then once it's set at 90, you can always check with this to make sure that it's actually coming through at 90. And you'll want to check temperatures on your thermostat like every day or every other day. And you want to check with this as well, just to make sure that nothing's happening. You don't want to experience any sort of burns or malfunctions or anything like that with the heat pad so it's best to have a thermostat and an infrared thermometer and to check the temperatures regularly just to be sure with an under tank heater you do not need to use any other heating that will be enough sufficient heat and the under tank heater should not cover the entire bottom of the enclosure it should only cover one third of the bottom of the enclosure so two thirds regular room temperature one third the heater now what happens is the heater will put some heat out and it will create a nice little like gradient that the leopard gecko can pass over if they want you know somewhere in like the 70s it'll be over on the cool end of the room which by the way the cool end should be in the 70s i think mine's usually around like 74 or 75 because it's the room temperature but the hot end should be 90 so between the 90 end and the 75 end, there'll be a gradient of temperature, and then your leopard gecko, because they thermoregulate their cold-blooded animal, they can pass between the hot and cold temperatures to regulate their body temperature, which is essential for basically living and essential for digestion. Oh, and one last thing, I don't think it's really important what brand of heater that you use. Make sure it has decent reviews and just make sure you use a thermostat because then you won't be running the risk of having it overheat. But for reference sake, I use a Reptitherm heater. I use the 8 watt ones that are built for 10 to 20 gallons and that has worked for my leopard geckos. Plenty of other people use under tank heaters that are not the kind that I use or they use heat tape and that kind of stuff and it, they all work well so it's definitely something that you can choose uh, on your own after doing a little bit of research into like different brands and what has the best reviews and whatnot. So now that we've covered the enclosure and decor and heating I want to move on to a very important section feeding and supplementation. So let's start with how to supplement them. In the enclosure, remember how I said you're going to need to have a bowl of calcium. This is the calcium you're going to put in that bowl. It doesn't have to be this brand, it can be any brand, as long as it is calcium carbonate. It has to be pure calcium, calcium carbonate. It cannot be calcium plus D3. It cannot be calcium plus D3 and other vitamins. It has to be pure calcium. The reason that it has to be pure calcium is that leopard geckos can overdose on D3 and it causes death basically uh, so you don't want to have that happen I've had that happen to me it wasn't from my experience it was a gecko that I adopted and had already had too much d3 in its system and uh, consequently passed away I have a video all about supplementation if you want to hear me go more into detail about it I talk about this and I talk about this so 
definitely go watch that, but I'll be touching on it a little bit in this video. So you're gonna take the calcium, which is just pure white calcium. Let's see if it'll focus. Focus. Okay, well, it's not gonna focus. Well then, but yeah, so I just, I keep a little tablespoon measure in here or a teaspoon measure and I just scoop some out and I put it in the bowl. And pretty much as soon as I put it in there, like when I put fresh calcium in, they eat it. Oh, that's, that's what they'll do by the way, if you didn't assume. They'll just eat it, they eat the calcium. They eat it plain, they just eat it right out of the bowl. It's delightful to watch them lap up the calcium. I got this off of Amazon. It is Best Naturals brand. I have ordered this and I have ordered the Now brand. It's just Now Calcium Carbonate. I don't know why it's called Now, but that's what it's called. And that brand was good too. So both of them came off of Amazon. You can get them there. They're really inexpensive. It's like, I don't know, I think it was like seven bucks for this whole thing. I can't remember how much I paid, but yeah, it's pretty inexpensive. That's gonna be the calcium in the enclosure, but there's also gonna be calcium that you have to dust their insects with. And that is this Rapashi Calcium Plus. Before I got this, I was using Calcium Plus D3, just like a regular old supplement uh, that wasn't this. This is better because it is fortified with other vitamins that are essential for your gecko, such as vitamin A. This came to me, recommended by my vet, after one of my geckos who was adopted came in actually with the other gecko who had the D3 overdose. She had too little calcium, and so I was told to immediately start her on the calcium supplement that the vet gave us. This is what she also said to start giving to all my leopard geckos and i had never heard of it i didn't know anything about it i just thought of rapashi as making crested gecko food but when i talked to some of my breeder friends about this they were like yes that is the best calcium offer that to them and i was like oh, okay you right you right so let me show you what it looks like if it'll focus it's just a white calcium very very fine very good smelling it smells like it smells good to me. I don't know. It smells good. I think it smells good to some of my leopard geckos too because when I got Benjin, she was like, he's really responsive to food that has rapashi on it. And I was like, good, because that's what I got now. And it's just amazing because it has vitamins that are essential to your reptile. I don't know why all calciums with D3 wouldn't have the vitamins that they need in it. They should. But uh, yeah, this is the one that I recommend wholeheartedly. And you dust this on their food, so... I'll get to the insects that you can feed here in a second, but no matter what you're offering, you can put this on the insects. I do it every two feedings, so I'll do a feeding with, and then a feeding without, feeding without, a feeding with. That's how much I do. And don't forget that it's not like they're gonna be calcium deficient if you don't offer this really often because they have the calcium in their bowl. It is important for them to get the vitamins and the D3 from this, so make sure that you are offering this on their food. Now, we can talk about the food that you can offer. I am going to be posting a video, I don't know if it'll come out before or after this one, all about my insects, how I breed them, how I feed them, how I keep them. In my closet at all times, I keep dubia roaches and I keep mealworms and superworms. I also sometimes have crickets for my frogs, and by sometimes I mean most of the time, but sometimes I run out and they get mealworms, which is fine. And then once a month, I offer hornworms and waxworms. Whether you choose to offer mealworms, superworms, or dubia roaches as a staple, you should definitely offer more than one, not at a time, but like over time so that they can have variety in their diet. You know, if you offer mealworms for like a week or so, offer superworms or dubia roaches the next week. You can also offer crickets. I personally don't like crickets. I think that they are too much of a hassle to bother feeding and they don't make like a sufficient meal for leopard geckos. A lot of the geckos that I've gotten that were underweight or just fed crickets, the people that had my geckos before just tossed crickets in the enclosure and that was that. And they didn't actually monitor what their gecko was eating. They didn't monitor how much their gecko was eating. They just let the crickets escape into the enclosure and then escape out of the enclosure, which is inevitable because crickets will find a way out. But the thing to remember is that crickets can bite and so you don't want to leave them in the enclosure. And also it's really hard for a leopard gecko to hunt down crickets. And so I think that it's just really wasteful because you're just going to put a bunch in there and some will escape. And yeah, it's just, in my opinion, better to offer a different kind of food. But crickets are fine to offer as long as you're offering other types of foods as well. Like I said, my personal favorite is superworms. And I have to hand feed like almost all of my leopard geckos. So feeding them superworms is really easy for me because I can just hold them with tongs and offer them to them. But if you have like a bowl 
you know, for food, you can just drop whatever you want to feed your, your leopard gecko in it, and then your leopard gecko will eat at night after you've left the room, most likely, because they don't want you to watch them. If you don't need a hand feed, then you don't really have to worry about the tong situation. I want to talk about hornworms and waxworms for a second, because hornworms are a great food to offer, and waxworms are not a great food to offer, but you can. So, I feed mine hornworms once a month. I would feed them more than once a month, but they are expensive, so I can't, but... Hornworms are super rich in calcium, and a lot of geckos who are picky eaters have their appetite restarted by a hornworm. So like, Benjen, for example, hasn't eaten in a bit. The other day I fed him hornworms, he ate two days in a row. So it's like something that really entices them. It's a big, green, sweet smelling, juicy, like delicious treat for them. They love it. And I love it too because it has calcium in it and it makes them happy. And it makes them eat when they're not eating. Now waxworms, on the other hand, are not nutritionally excellent. They are a leopard gecko equivalent to human junk food. So like something that we eat that tastes really good to us and we want more of it, but it doesn't actually do anything for our bodies. Waxworms are great for treats if you want to offer them once a month. They are fatty, so they'll add some weight to your gecko. So please don't feed them regularly. And you can also basically make your gecko malnourished and obese by feeding just waxworms. So please don't do that. And if your gecko isn't eating, don't fret and like force feed them like waxworms every day because they're not eating other types of food. It's really dangerous to just offer waxworms, especially if your gecko isn't eating because they can actually become addicted to waxworms and refuse all other types of food. Two geckos that I brought in last year, named Aria and Sansa, the ones I mentioned that had the calcium problems, were both addicted to waxworms. They would not eat any other food other than waxworms. It was a long process to try and get them to eat normal foods again. So you definitely don't want to start that addiction and you don't want to basically make your gecko obese and malnourished from just feeding them waxworms. I talked about that in a video about waxworms, so if you want to go see that, it's on my channel, you can go watch that, but I'm not going to say anything more about waxworms, just once in a while as a treat, they're fine. Make sure that you dust them with this. Since they don't offer any nutrition, you might as well dust them. Another thing that you can feed your leopard gecko is Rapashi Grub Pie. Rapashi Grub Pie is from the same brand, Rapashi, and it comes in a container like this. And it's a powder mixture that like is basically a bunch of dead bugs and other types of proteins that you mix with water and it makes like a thick paste, like a pudding. Not like a paste, it's thicker than that. Like it makes like a gelatin, almost like jello and some leopard geckos really love it. I've never tried it with mine because a lot of mine have special needs and need to be hand fed. I can't imagine trying to hand feed them like jelly consistency of stuff. Like, oh my God, it'd be a mess. It'd be everywhere. Eddard flings his head out of the way, gelatin everywhere, or a patchy grub pie all over the wall. Like, it'd be a mess. So I haven't tried it, but it smells horrible to me. It smells horrible. We tried it with our blue tongue skink. He liked it, but it smells terrible. It's definitely something you can try if you want to. I thought I'd include it, even though I don't personally use it. I wanna quickly address how to feed your leopard gecko, even though I've touched on it a bit. You can use a bowl to feed them. You can place your gecko in a separate container and have them hunt for food. This, I think, will be the least effective method in terms of feeding your leopard gecko, but you can try it. And another way you can do it is to drop food in front of your gecko and have them just like hunt one at a time while you're watching them. And the last way would be to tongue feed, uh, basically hand feed them, which is something that you don't have to do if you don't have a special needs one, but if you want to, it's fine too, it doesn't matter. And you don't want to leave insects in the enclosure without watching them because the insects could escape or the insects could go hide and therefore your gecko doesn't eat. And another thing about that is you want to make sure that you're watching your gecko eat so that you know how much your gecko's eating. And if you use a bowl, and all the insects are not in the bowl, then you know that your gecko ate. So you don't have to watch them, but you have to have a way of monitoring their intake. There's two more things I wanna talk about when it comes to feeding. One would be water. You need to offer a water dish and you need to offer fresh water every day. Make sure that your gecko always has water to drink from. Even if you never see your gecko drink from the water bowl, you must offer water. You must. Okay. And the last thing would be what not to feed your leopard gecko. Please, please, please do not feed your leopard gecko bread, do not feed your leopard gecko treats from around the house, do not feed your leopard gecko fruits or vegetables. Like, they, they don't eat that stuff. They are not humans, they're not birds, they're not rodents, they eat insects and that's it. Please only offer your leopard gecko insects. I have had people come to me and ask me, my leopard gecko isn't eating the kale I got him. I'm like, the kale, the no wonder, he's not supposed to eat kale. So please don't offer anything but insects 
to your leopard gecko and if it's an insect I haven't covered here I think one I know that I haven't covered is silkworm but I don't have any experience with them but always research if your gecko could have that type of worm if you're not sure or worm or insect or whatever always research first if you're not sure if your gecko could have a type of insect and please never catch the insect from outside and feed it to your leopard gecko you do not know where that insect was you don't know what it carries you don't know if it has any sort of diseases or any sort of weird parasites that would make your gecko sick you don't know if it has encountered pesticides that would make your gecko sick don't feed things from outside. And one last thing, some people like to feed their leopard geckos pinky mice. No, they're super fatty. They're really large. Leopard geckos can choke on them. Please don't feed your leopard gecko pinky mice. It's not necessary. It's just not, it's not. Okay, we're moving on. Now that we've covered housing, decor, food, supplementation, and heating. Well, I just added two there, didn't I? Oh well. We're gonna move on to the human hide. Now this is something a lot of people who have leopard geckos don't know that they need because pet stores don't talk about them. Human hides look like this. This is a very simple human hide. Okay, this is Eddard's human hide. Basically, it is just a Tupperware container with a hole cut in the front. You wanna make sure you cut a hole that's smooth that won't hurt yourself or your gecko. So use an X-Acto knife, which is a tiny little fine blade to cut the edges and make sure it's big enough that your leopard can fit in and make sure that the edges don't have any pokies that could hurt you or your gecko like i said and then you place a paper towel on the inside this is eddard's lid literally has so much calcium it just dusted off he plays in his calcium like no tomorrow but oh i almost dropped it make sure that you have a paper towel okay fold it up and place it on the inside i lay mine flat i pour water in and i poke it into all the corners and make it flat so that it sticks to everything make sure that it's like a nice uniform surface I just put this in there yesterday that why it has so much water in it but I have to keep Eddard's a little bit more wet than everybody else's because he has trouble shedding sometimes because he's an enigma and he also doesn't have a water dish because he'll like drown himself because he's an enigma with enigma syndrome so he licks the water from his paper towel which means his paper towel has to get clean more often than everyone else's and it has to stay wetter it's just he's he's extra okay so that's why water just got poured out of there onto my foot but anyways you want to take a spray bottle and spray through the hole. Like you just take a spray bottle and spray into the hole and make sure that you are covering the sides and the surface with water, like little water droplets. And also you want the paper towel to be wet as well. If you put your hand in there, you should feel water and you should have some water droplets, okay? That's how moist it should be in my opinion. And change the paper towel like once a week. Whenever it starts getting nasty, change it. Whenever it gets this colored, change it. If they poop in it, change it. If they shed in it, change it. It's better to be safe than sorry because you don't want this to get nasty because it stays wet, so you just don't want it to get nasty. Humid hides are essential, in my opinion, essential to keeping a healthy leopard gecko because it offers moisture and it is essential for geckos to shed properly. They have to have moisture in their enclosures in the form of a humid hide. A lot of geckos will just lay in their humid hides, like they enjoy it, they like the sensation of the humidity and the moisture, they'll drink out of them, they'll use them for like, you know, climbing on like Eddard does where he puts his calcium all over the top. But uh, yeah, I think absolutely 100% humid hides are essential. And you can use paper towel like I have. I only use paper towel in them. I don't use anything else. Please do not use moss. By moss, I mean like sphagnum moss, any type of moss that you would buy like from a pet store or any moss in general, please do not use. It can be ingested by the leopard gecko. I have seen multiple occasions leopard geckos being impacted or dying from having impaction from moss. And that goes back to the whole loose substrate thing. So if you wanna watch that video, please, please do. I highly recommend if you, if you think that loose substrate is okay or you're not sure, please go watch that video and hopefully you'll change your mind. But if you put moss in here, sure, it'll stay wet and that's the purpose of a humid hide. But also they could accidentally eat the moss and die, which is totally not worth it, obviously. You wouldn't wanna to have to have your gecko be impacted and then, you know, have to go to the vet and have surgery to remove it. It's just not worth it. Don't use moss. What you can use, however, is EcoEarth. EcoEarth is a coconut fiber substrate that you can buy from the pet store. It comes in bags, it comes in bricks. Personally, don't use EcoEarth. I don't want to risk any sort of impaction, but tons and tons and tons of people use moistened EcoEarth in humid hides to offer moisture, and it works fine for them, so it is a possibility. However, 
I prefer paper towels and they're cheaper so that's easier. I just totally prefer paper towels and that's what I recommend to you guys. So I think that's everything. We covered the humid hide, we covered the way to heat an enclosure, we covered how big an enclosure has to be and that it has to have a secure lid and a, I prefer front opening doors. We covered that you shouldn't use a heat lamp, that you shouldn't use a heat rock. We covered that UVB is not necessary. We covered that the best calcium products to use are these two and how to offer them. We covered the types of food that you can offer your geckos and we covered the ways to keep track of how hot your under tank heater is getting. One last thing is you must have a vet for your leopard gecko even if you think that you are never ever going to have to take your leopard gecko to the vet, which I mean you probably won't have to bring them off and I'll be honest with you, but you definitely need to have a vet that you know that you can take your leopard gecko to because they are an exotic. They can't be taken to a vet that just treats dogs and cats. They have to see a vet that treats reptiles. Before getting a leopard gecko I definitely recommend finding a vet that way you know beforehand if anything goes wrong you'll definitely have someone with experience to fall back on if something bad happens to your leopard gecko and i mean it just makes sense in my mind to have a vet always no matter what pet you're getting that you know you can go to if you have some sort of uh, medical emergency with your animal another thing i want to address is the topic of cohabbing i have a video all about cohabbing please go watch that that'll be much more in depth than this little bit that i'm about to say here I don't agree with cohabbing. I have separated geckos that I got together in the past, such as Sansa and Arya, and I thought that them being cohabbed together was completely unnecessary, and so I separated them. I think that leopard geckos thrive on their own. Arya and Sansa were housed together. When I separated them, Arya thrived, and so I definitely agree with keeping them on their own. If you are inclined to have more than one leopard gecko, or if you already have more than one leopard gecko, please go watch my cohabbing video. You will learn a bit more, hopefully, and you'll find it insightful. All right, guys, I think that's everything. This is a lot, like, this is a lot. This video is 51 minutes long as I'm looking at it right now unedited. And if you made it all the way through, thank you so much. I'm glad that you are that invested in your animal that you want to learn from me. And I have a little bit of experience with leopard geckos. You know, I have 22 of them and I've been keeping them for a few years and I keep special needs ones. So I have a little bit more experience, I feel like, than uh, most people who just have one or two, but that doesn't make what I say any more valuable or any less valuable. I think that after this video, your journey is not over. You need to go watch other videos, you need to learn from other people, you need to do some research on your own. Having an animal, it takes a lot more than just one video from one person that will give you everything you need to know. Granted, I feel like if you went off of everything I said in this video, you'd be, you'd be pretty set. But that's just my opinion. You should go listen to what other people have to say because they may have something that I don't have in terms of their intelligence and knowledge regarding leopard gecko care. At the end of the day, you have to be confident in your knowledge about leopard geckos before having one and if you already have one and you just want to learn more that's great too because learning never stops i learn new things all the time it's a good chance that i forgot to mention something in this video so please when you're done watching look down below anything that i've forgotten ever i will come back to this video and type in the bottom in the description because i never want to put information out there that is not complete and so if i forgot something i apologize now in advance and i will put it down below so please go check that out also in the down below you can find links to social media where you can ask me any questions if you ever have a question or concern you can also ask questions in this comment section down below and i will get back to you i am fully open-minded to answering any question that you might have so even if you think it's a stupid question please ask it i would much rather have you ask something you consider to be a stupid question than to go on without having an answer to what might be a very important question thank you guys so much for watching i hope that you enjoyed I hope that you found this insightful. Please subscribe and hit the bell and come back to all these other videos that I have about my leopard geckos, whether it be educational or just fun or whether it not be about leopard geckos in general. Please share this with someone who has a leopard gecko or is looking to get a leopard gecko because this information is definitely useful information or else I wouldn't have shared it with you. And it could definitely help their journey with learning about leopard geckos. All right guys, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.